Tonight, we talk family, religion, and sexual health. You probably know of or have met or even interacted with one of our guests. If you have or have not, his is a story to tell. Professor Reverend Canon Gideon Biamche, a man of God who carried a mark that he has used to pass on a message. He joins us in the studio tonight with his daughter, Patience Businje. Uh, remarried with HIV, you know, produced children, you know, in a, in a way that uh, takes that into context, you know, so everything about me now uh, has raised that consciousness about family, uh, religion, and sexual health, but most particularly HIV AIDS health. You make what would ideally normally be a difficult conversation sound very, very simple and, and normal. Um, what was it like being you in the 90s? You said 1992? Yes. Uh, and I know that that's when uh, Philip, oh, you know, uh, close to the time uh, Philip Bongole Uta's song came out. Yes, uh, actually, he inspired me a lot. I was struggling with my uh, own issues, and that time he had opened up, and I was listening to his music, you know, all the time. I would play his music every morning, midday, evening, you know, to, to get inspired because I wanted a role model. And then there was Major Varamira Ranga, uh, also inspired me a lot. So the 90s were really tough for me. There is only one year that was good uh, in, in the 90s, and that is 1990, 19. Okay. Uh, when my daughter Patience was born. Uh, the rest are very really challenging. In 91, I, uh, I lose her mom when she's only 14 months. Uh, 92, I am told I'm positive. You know, 90, uh, 98, I'm, I'm, I'm going down with AIDS. Uh, you, you know, so it was challenging, except 95 there, that's when again some smile came back uh, when I married uh, a, a, a another wife. Uh, herself positive, widowed like me, uh, so uh, that brought a smile on my face again, but also brought that challenge of what we are discussing about uh, family, religion, and uh, uh, sexual health. How do you, the two of you, you are positive, how do you marry <laughs> without producing children who are, who are positive? So that yeah. brings in a new dimension and uh, things have we have to discuss that we have to agree we have to be disciplined in doing what we have agreed you know <laughs> so I so 90 a mixed bag of, of challenge but also because of my deep faith in the religion and God you know strengthening my faith to say now when the going gets tough the tough get going. going when you look back okay um, 1992 mm. did you have any any what was your reaction when you found out your hiv i was reading in the daily monitor a long time ago how um when the doctor was giving you the results he, mm. he it wasn't the manner you expected you weren't very happy with how he did it but were you shocked by the results what did you think when you got them i didn't get shocked by the results actually i got shocked by the manner the way I was receiving them. <laughs> because that time, um, the, the, the counseling between testing and receiving the results took two weeks. So you had time to process. And um, already I was, I had been told that my first wife had died of an AIDS related illness. Uh, thank God that. Uh, we had managed to save uh, patients from getting infected uh, miraculously uh, through cesarean. Um, but um, I had come to gravitate to the point that I could be positive. Um, you have four pints of blood in you. Uh, the, the donor is dead, the wife is dead of AIDS. Your own spouse is dead of AIDS. Uh, so what chances do you have that you are negative? So by the time I'm receiving the results, uh, I am 
90% sure that I could be positive. I even, I remember the counselor asking me, would you want a confirmatory test? Oh. And I'm like, no, <laughs> don't need it. Yeah, so the results didn't shock me. It is how he handed them over to me with a mocking um, tone. A tone, man of God, because I was in my corner, man of God. What are you going to do? Not in a sympathetic way, but like in a mocking way, like even you. So what are you going to do? And But thank God for that because it, it introduced me to the whole issue of, okay, so this is the stigma I have read about. <laughs> this is the stigma I have heard people discuss. So now I was getting experiencing it firsthand. And I remember him telling him, well, uh, you know, counselor, I didn't come here with a strategic plan on how I'm going to handle this. But now that you tell me that I'm positive, the God who created me is going to give me guidance on how to handle the situation. You spoke about the donor being dead uh, and his wife being dead. Yes. Um, that sort of gives an idea on how you uh, caught HIV. No, it doesn't. It only complicates the, the situation. Okay. <laughs> because Try and break it down. <laughs> <laughs> Simplify. Yeah, because many people ask me, how did you get the virus? And I look back and I can't guess. Because I married in 1987. And we didn't take an HIV test. And uh, then in 1998, I'm getting that transfusion. And then in 1990, uh, 1991, my wife is dying. Um, so the only sure way I can know I did not pick the virus is from mother to child. But the sexual route, there is a probability could that I been. could have got it through sex. Uh, the blood route, there is a be, very big probability. With the transfusion. The injection route, remember during that time, you know, it was a time, you talk of the 90s, uh, the 90s were complicated also in the collapsed health system mm -hmm. uh, following Ida Min's rule and the war, you know. So a nurse would have only one injection, a needle, uh, and he has, she has about 30 patients. So she's calculating like one needle should serve about six. <laughs> so she would only change the medicines. And next... She reads your letter. Next, you know, uh, thank God we are handling issues about family. Yep. Uh, because now uh, from there you pick the virus uh, from an injection. Then you go home and pass it on through uh, sexual intercourse with your wife or with your husband. And, you know, or sometimes you are sharing uh, uh, needles without knowing. Uh, so it's a complicated question. People tend to think I'm dodging it. But I'm just being realistic that uh, people who are accurate on how they got infected could be internalizing the stigma uh, that says you get HIV when you have sex before marriage or outside marriage. So when you say, how did you get it or when? He, they use when they had sex in the hotel or under the tree as a benchmark. And they say, oh, I know I got positive in 19 this. But okay. for me, sincerely, I can't. But I think, Josephine, I've reached a point where I feel like, but is it really important for me to dwell on how I got positive? Mm -hmm. Or maybe what is most important now is to think through what should I do? I think the question came up a lot for you because, again, like the doctor said, you are a man of the cloth, so there are bound to be questions around that. But what did your family um, say? How did you break the news to them? What was your life like after that? Oh, challenging, <laughs> challenging. Um, the first, actually, it's not my, the, 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 the first, the actually, a family member uh, is the one who told me that my wife had died of a pneumonia that is related to HIV. And um, so when I got the results, it is her that I went back to, to, to disclose. I actually disclosed to th three people that day. One was my principal at the theological college where I was training. 
uh, other priests because I had graduated with the first class and with my first degree being in education, they had thought I could be good material for uh, a permanent position. So I was being retained to do a postgraduate course, uh, a PhD in theology, and that's when the disaster struck. So I went and told my principal of the results. Then I went and told the staff, told the, the students, and then told my sister-in-law who had broke the news. And if, I think how she replied could be a good model for all those families that are struggling with these issues. Uh, because she looked me in the face, you know, hugged me and said, you know, Gideon, we loved you as a family before HIV, and we will continue loving you even with this new situation. Mm -hmm. And that was true. S so healing, so, I don't know, so transformative. Uh, I, um, it gave me hope that I can carry on because many family members fear rejection. Yeah. They fear being, you know, you know, uh, pointed fingers, you killed our daughter, you killed, you know, that did not happen with, with you within the family. You disclosed it okay. uh, to me, those situations. Instead, she assured me, irrespective of how things are going to be, they will remain uh, loving me and looking after me. All right, but well, let's take a short break. You've been very patient. Patience, so we're <laughs> going to start with you when we return. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We are coming to you from the Serena Conference Center. And tonight we're talking about religion, family, and sexual health. Patience, I promised we'd start with you. Listening to these conversations, what is it like for you? Isn't it difficult? Thank you, Josephine. Um, difficult would not be, uh, would not be what I think. Um, although, yes, there have been challenges, and there are still rather quite some challenges. But uh, I thank God because my dad, Canon Gideon, is, has, is and has been a man of wisdom um, all these years. Um, growing up in, the, in a home where you have a father who's loving and caring, this is, having HIV is the list of things you'd be cared to know, okay, to deal with or to, you know, have it as a thing that leads how you react towards that person. So finding out about it was um, mostly, or even paying attention to it, was mostly when I was in school. Um, my dad had tried to reach out to me and you know, explain a few things here and there when I was about, I think, six. Mm -hmm. But as a child, really, those are things that are not Do you not remember concerning. anything about what that conversation was like? Yes, I remember. Um, so it happened that um, I had been raised by a different mother to begin with because I'd lost my mom. But um, I, I, I really thought the other mom was my real mom. And a cousin teased me and said, oh, you know, um, that's not your real mom. She's not your real mom. Your mom kicked a bucket. So I, I had to go and ask my father and said, but what does kicking a bucket mean? So that's where the conversation began. Oh, you know, you had your mom. This, this, and this happened. So I... I, I I, I got opened up to that knowledge. I was about six. But it wasn't until when I was in a primary at Gaza, a Gaza Junior School that um, this thing came back to me. Um, some children got to know because my dad was a very open man about how he was living his life and he was really trying to connect with as many other people as possible to ca um, come on board and um, take the fight on. So children got to know about my dad's uh, position, his status, and I started getting teased. And uh, they would say, oh, her dad has HIV, he's going to die soon, and whatnot, and whatnot. So I remember calling my dad very frantically. <laughs> uh, that was in the 90s. And I said, Dad, you need to come here and explain a few things. <laughs> do you remember that phone call? I do. Yes. What were you thinking? 
Well, I have a philosophy really uh, that has helped me uh, in family issues that if a child calls you, be, be available. Number two, if she asks you an intelligent question, she deserves an intelligent answer. So, you know, I, I went to school, I, <laughs> I asked the headmistress, the headmistress said, okay, she's there. Uh, we went to a football pitch and said, I said, okay, now, yes, share your story. And uh, yes, yeah, she told me, you know, I have issues here. Children are, go are telling me you are dying. Is it true you are dying? And I started from there. I said, there is a difference between AIDS and HIV. I'm HIV positive, like I told you before, um, but uh, I'm no, I don't have AIDS. And then she said, what does that mean? So I explained. Okay. And then she asked me and said, so you mean uh, you will still be alive when I finish senior four? I don't know why she, she chose that baseline of senior four, not P7, not university. But um, I said, yeah, why not? Uh, if, if God continues being gracious, and I continue getting the support from my family members and from society, there is a possibility that uh, uh, your wish will be granted. Uh, and then she said, okay, now I understand that. But now when these children continue telling me you're dying, what do I tell them? Then I said, okay, you turn to them and say, me, I know my father has HIV, but you yourselves, how sure are you that your daddies don't have? Ooh. And I think it worked because. <laughs> <laughs> Will you ever ask yeah. that again? Yes. Um, so because I needed to know more and, you know, <laughs> to be better informed on how I can respond to the children, um, that was my first actual experience of stigma uh, concerning this issue. So when I had a talk with him and he gave me that um, uh, wisdom, that's how... I went back to them when they asked again, and I was like, well, how sure are your parents <laughs> are not safe? And, you know, slowly by slowly, the children just started, you know, um, backing off. I can Others, imagine the questions that were being asked at their homes that yes, holiday. Yes. Others, because of the information I'd received from my father, I, I, I would actually try to go a little uh, further to explain and highlight, and also just to inform them that, you know, it's, it's not the end and to encourage them also but basically to um to also re make them realize that stigma making someone feel discriminated because of that wasn't the right thing to do yes okay is there stigma even now um no i would Not say uh, personally for me no I wouldn't say that. <laughs> also, uh, I say that because, uh, like I told you, when you have a father who you love, who you care about, the first thing you think about when you look at him is not his status of having HIV and AIDS. So uh, I, I think I tend to look out with this thing of acceptance and expect the same from everybody else, okay. total acceptance, whatever the case. Reverend Cannon, Dr. Professor. Is there a stigma for you, even now? The stigma is there, outside there, but uh, I don't feel it. I, I, I have resolved the competencies to deal with it. For example, if you speak and then um, people, you are inter being introduced and then they say, oh, we have a, a visitor here, he's a reverend, he's a canon, and people are like, wow, and he's a professor and yeah, wow <laughs> uh, you know and and then they say he's hiv positive you see oh, huh? you know you see <laughs> yeah. already you feel the impact that uh, the, the 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 status people are giving you is now being subtracted but you are prepared for that mm. or they ask you a question like how did you get it you say reverend you know you say you are positive how did you get it uh there is where i went in nigeria and after i had given I usually give them a chance to ask questions and then said, uh, someone asked, uh, Reverend, you have said you are positive. Have you ever repented about it? 
Oh. Yeah. Like you said, the assumption for having HIV. Yes, is immorality. Yeah. That uh, sex before marriage or sex outside marriage. Um, and, and this conversation we're having is very important because these children that we are teasing patients, we are picking the conversation from the dinner ta dining table. I think the adults would be speaking, backbiting, mm -hmm. and then the children would pick it and then they say, okay, so I know yeah. what to tell them when I... So it's very important to, to choose which topics we are discussing at table with children. Or even if they are not, we may assume they are not hearing, <laughs> but they may be picking. They're always listening. Yeah, yeah they're always listening in a way. Do you, do you know how much impact your story has had um, since you've shared it? Have you had people come and talk to you and say, you know, the same way uh, uh, Philly Lutaire influenced you? Yeah. I can have a guess, you know, I can have a <laughs> guess. I will never know the real yeah. impact, but uh, I really have a, like, when I started this ministry in 1992, I, uh, I was the first religious leader in Africa to do so, to disclose openly, and people were like, uh, you know, and uh, so that went on. But then I said, I think there could be other religious leaders mm -hmm. who are really positive and are hesitating and are feeling stigmatized and shamed and abandoned and are dying in shame. Uh, so I got that burden and look, looked for them, and now we are 13,000 members. 13,000? Yeah. In Africa? In 25 countries. Yeah. So those, among them, that were, I, I remember one of them was really dying when we held our first retreat in Zimbabwe. Uh, has, his CD4 count was 80, 8 zero. Uh, but you know, he picked up and uh, now he's, 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 he's a strong man. He go, went on to marry again, produce children who are negative, and now he's a bishop. I mean, it's amazing what support can do. Uh, yes. You know, so then recently I went to a, a school in Ruzira, which I think is an SDA church uh, run school, and I was speaking to young people, and one of the young girls after the talk came to me and said, you don't know what you have done for me. I said, what is it? I was in senior one. I wanted to commit suicide because I was born positive and I was tired of life. I was tired of the stigma. I was tired of medicine. And, but I saw you on television and I got interested. I, I learned that you, you are well educated. You have many degrees. You are married. You have children who are negative. I just threw away the poison. Wow. Now, I am in S6, I'm waiting for my exams. Wow. That, that girl really uh, made my day. Uh, there is another one who, because we have a, a youth training center, we picked her when she was in, uh, she had dropped out at, at P6. We gave her two years of training. She did fashion, she made money, did primary seven, did all level. Uh, when I last had her testimony, she was saying, I'm waiting for my uh, A-level results. Mm. So those are some of the simple things. Re recently, I was in Addis, I met a young girl, and she said, you came to Rwanda, I heard you speak, and now I do the things you do. And I have got many awards. So there are many things that uh, this ministry can do to mm -hmm. inspire people who are being stigmatized to know that they can, God loves them, irrespective of what people are telling them. Yeah. Um, family members can be tough, can be difficult, but to show them that, no, there is another family that has yeah. loved and loved uh, mm -hmm. continuously, both from my former wives, uh, my brothers, my sisters, they are very supportive. My sister, my own sister said, when I lost my wife, she, she closed her house and said, I will only go back to my house when my brother gets another woman. And tell you what, the day I married Pamela is the day we gave her away. So I'm from the church, I, I changed into a council. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so we have now the same ceremony. When I'm okay. celebrating 20 years, they are celebrating. Yeah. You know, that type of love that yeah. 
these circumstances, whether you know it's HIV, whether it is teenage pregnancy, whether it is you know it should not separate. In fact, at a family setting, that's the time people need love and support most. Mm. But mm. Uh, in real life, it's the opposite. It is the time when they are castigated and run out. Well, let's take another short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Tonight we're talking about religion, family, and sexual health. I'll start with you, patients. Um, tell me about Friends of Canon Gideon Foundation. Okay. Um, Friends of Canon Gideon Foundation is a non-for-profit organization. It is um, faith-based, and within there we do a lot of ministry concerning HIV and AIDS. But um, one of the biggest prog uh, program that we have there is. Um, empowering young and vulnerable children, orphans and vulnerable children. Um, we mostly take into consideration people who have been affected, infected, or, you know, have, uh, by HIV and AIDS. So we take these young people uh, with an aim of giving them skills that will make them wholesome um, to be able to contribute to more to the development of the society. Right. Uh, yeah. This foundation was started in the early years when you just found out, right? Yeah. And I think mm. it was a fundraising. 1992. Project. Okay. It was Friends of Gideon Fellowship. Yeah. Okay. But then, because they realized I needed help, I needed prayers, I needed, so they yeah. formed a fellowship to give me that spiritual support. Okay. And then later on, when uh, in 2003, when I got my third award that had a cash prize on it, uh, uh, me and Pamela said we let's hand over this money to the fellowship so that we do what she has said, um, empower okay. young people. Mm. And then they had to register, and by then I was a canon, so it changed to Friends of mm. Canon Gideon Foundation. I had you today speaking about sexual reproductive health, and I, I thought I'd pick your, your brain on that mm. as a man of the cloth. And I, uh, um, what are your thoughts on sexuality education? We are doing badly uh, as, as, as a country and as a continent. Uh, we, because when we talk about, in the region, uh, there is a lot of talk about life and death. And in, in death, we have six types of death. Preventable death, postponable death, reversible death, controllable death, inevitable death, and transformable death. Now, when you look at Africa and Uganda, most of the deaths are not inevitable. They are preventable, they are controllable, they could have been reversed with good, accurate analysis and interventions. So when it comes to sexual health, uh, we are really doing badly. We, we are doing something as a country, but we could do more. Um, if we could, for example, differentiate between right behavior and safe behavior. If we could tease out, for example, words like sex, sexuality, sexual health, sexual acts, many people confuse them. When you say, I want to teach people about sexual health, they say, oh, you want to teach them about sexual acts. <laughs> and when you say, I want to bring uh, in a curriculum a subject on sexuality education, oh, you want to teach our children uh, how to fornicate. But these are, d are different. And I think if we could take time and say sex is just talking about whether you are male or female. Yeah. Sexuality is how then your biological setup makes you feel and how that means to you, uh, you know, biologically, socially, spiritually, you know. And then gender issues, how the, the culture now goes into to define, so if you are a woman, how you should, what we should expect. Sexual health is whether 
uh, your biological organs, which God created for a particular situation or for to love and then to procreate, whether they are kept healthy uh, and they are not also affecting other parts of the body. Remember, if one part of the body is, 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 is sick, <laughs> the others are sick also. Yeah. So sexual health becomes actually body health and it becomes spiritual health, it becomes mental health. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very important subject, but we... We're doing badly. We, when the subject is brought, people guard, you know, it's like they block, uh, <laughs> they think, no, no, don't talk about those things. They're taboo subjects. And in Africa, I think people say sex is what we do, it's not what we talk about. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time we really, we, we said, why is the most religious continent the most sick? We, we, we really need to interrogate that and say, surely. Uh, I was in the UK, five, only 5% five of the people believe uh, in God. But you ask them HIV, they say, st not statistically significant. You come here, the churches are full. You put three services, they will, three services will be full. But we, we are having a prevalence rate of 70%. Uh, this morning we are being told that uh, between 15 to 19 age group of young people, uh, close to 10,000 get infected every day. Now, really, that is not a good sign that we're explaining to young people that there is what we call right sex and safe sex. And you need both if you are to grow holistically and be fulfilled holistically. Right sex will uh, give you what we, we say a spiritual health. Uh, safe sex will give you physical health. And you need both. Um, patients, what is the conversations you used to have at the dining table? Yes. <laughs> 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 I sigh because um, they were tough. At the, you know, being a young person, uh, these are not things you'd want to talk about with your parents. Sometimes you're shy, sometimes, you know. But uh, I thank God, uh, God that my dad has always been a very open person, a uh, very open father, and he created a, a relationship where I could openly approach him. Besides that, I didn't really have anyone else. Um, so I, we used to have that, uh, a few of those conversations, and we'd talk about that, and I'd ask him questions. Whatever was not clear, he would uh, be sure to yeah. make clear. The one time he, 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 you know, she brought to a group called True Love Weights. Uh, oh, I remember that group. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so I had to ask him, what does that really mean? <laughs> and we, we discussed. Then I asked him, uh-huh, now you assume we have, you have waited for 20 years, 23 years, 25 years, and the waiting is over. Tell me that day how you will handle yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> because that's people wait you know it, and it's a very painful thing for parents and for even young people that you have kept yourself pure and then you get infected on your first marital day because no one said that after waiting you graduate and you graduate in this way uh, so that the, the behavior is safe yeah. and it's also right. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the, to the priest to wed you, you are doing it right. But is it safe? So these are things that for family health, for sexual health, these should be part of daily discussion uh, to know that, for example, now I have this water, you have given it to me, it's mine. So in religious language, we say, uh, I am doing the right thing to drink my water. But if we have not taken trouble to make it purified, then it's not safe. My water, my own water will give me disease. That's true. But if someone steals my water when I'm conversing with you and takes it, we call him a <laughs> sinner. But if they boil the water, they won't have sickness, they won't fall sick. But are they still guilty of sin? Yes. 
Are they sick of typhoid? No. So these are, <laughs> these are issues we need to discuss that you can be born again and suffer teenage pregnancy because of what people have done to you, not what you have done. Okay. Uh, Canon, in 2015, you attacked... 2015, yes. Yeah, yeah. with uh, colon rectal cancer? Yes, stage three. Uh, very tough experience. This is four years later. Yeah, almost yes. five. You look mm. healthier than most. Well, the and Lord... And we know what we think about cancer. The Lord is still gracious. The Lord is still gracious. Uh, I did uh, 11, 11 hours surgery in Nakasero. Um, they had to remove the colon. Uh, then I went to India for uh, uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy for six months. Uh, I've been going there every three months or six months. Now they have increased it to one year. So I'm due for review March 2020. Wow. But the road has been gracious and people have been so kind, so gracious. So mm. This support system we are talking about, probably people don't know the value. And uh, we should emphasize it when we are talking about sexual health in a family setting. Uh, when challenges come, the family should really bond, the community should bond, your faith sector should bond to be able, and I, I think that's how I have coped. Uh, because uh, people say, how have you survived cancer? And I really don't have the answer, because it is everything. I've done science, chemo, I've done uh, spiritu spiritual therapy, I pray, you know, I pray as if there is no medicine, I take medicine as if prayer doesn't work, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all those things work in, but uh, you can see a holistic uh, approach to, to, to health could really do Uganda proud, and uh, these people who are really uh, not embracing the sexuality framework that the Minister of Education has put on the table. I would really beg them that uh, we do a dialogue to, to look at what is missing, uh, how can it be, but because it, it's, it's really taking us to another level that uh, government uh, and the First Lady and the Minister and her team and all of other stakeholders are saying, look, we shouldn't suffer things that are preventable are controllable, you know, are avoidable, just because we are failing to talk about them or we are talking about them in a way that makes them worse. Yeah. Well, patients, they always say when you're a preacher's daughter or a reverend's daughter, whichever you put it, you're always the spoiled children. Was, yeah. Is that you? Or are you <laughs> under the cover of um, the conversations at the dinner table? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting that you say that because, yes, I, I, I lived that life where that was always a label, right from primary. And even the other girls, actually, that I happened to study with that were um, children of the clerics suffered the same thing. Um, but, uh, you know, those are things that you overcome as you grow. And, uh, again, it all comes with, you know, being informed and, and knowing who you are exactly. Uh, for me, how I overcame that, of course, a bit, it, it a bit affected my identity in a way. Okay, I'm a reverend's daughter. This is how I should act. This is how I should. But at the end of the day, there was me and I needed to, to come through. So um, I thank God again that uh, the, the wise man, <laughs> as I like to to, to call him was there to guide me through. It was not easy. It's never easy. But uh, again, we need to we, we need parents who are there who provide platforms for their children to have those times where they can talk and talk talk openly about each and everything. Uh, I was an only child for a long time, so I really really needed that space. Uh, I thank God that today I am blessed with two sisters. Actually, one is uh, sitting her uh, senior four exams right now, mm. and our last born is about 14 years old. Mm. Yes. And, you know, they come to me with the same questions. Now that I'm a big sister, they come to me with the same questions I used to ask him. <laughs> 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 oh, you know, at school. But for them, they seem to be having it easier than I did. I don't know why. Um, 
I think it's the, the, the information age now. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. They, they seem to be, I'm like, okay, how do you feel, you know, when dad comes and he, 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 may, he has talks at school about his status. I say, ah, it's no more. It's no more. <laughs> That's what they said. I'm like, what? So the stigma bit, yes, uh, that will always be there. We can't change everybody, but at least we can make an impact and influence how people look uh, at this issue and how they support it. What would you like us to, to take home today? I, I know that your father has a book that's out, Labors of Love. Yes. Labors of Love is uh, his uh, very most recent publication. Um, for those who would like to, I know many people have had a testimony, but uh, if you want to know more, rather than just a testimony, um, be educated a little more and, and, you know, just know where it all began from and where we are headed, what the vision is, especially now as Uganda seeks to end and sustain the, to sustain the end of HIV AIDS by 2030. Um, Labors of Love, I would encourage everyone to read because, again, like he mentioned, his life has been a journey that has been supported by many, many, many. And mm. we, he was able to recognize a few of them in the book. Many are still out there. So we just want everybody to be a part of it. All right. Yes. Reverend, your, your final thoughts. Well, just before you, you give us your final thoughts, I was wondering about the signs. What got you to go and get uh, tested for cancer? Oh, um, uh, I saw blood in my stool twice. One, uh, one time I was in, this, in Cape Town uh, doing the workshop and then I saw stool, um, blood. I thought it was an accident. Then I was invited to give a lecture at Emory University in the US. Again, I noticed blood. So I said, no, when I come back to Uganda, I should take uh, this seriously. And when I did, uh, my doctor said, wow, this could be serious. So they referred me to a professor, uh, Majid Kajimu, who did a test, and indeed the tumor was. I, I thought that is also how people collapse and people say, because the tumor was really big. So if, if it busts inside there, then you are, you are done. Thank God uh, I, I got very good doctors who managed to uh, remove the tumor. And then I, I did the other treatments to, to, to hit the cancer. And uh, then God added more miracles. You know, we say, if you do, if we do what we can, God will do what we can't. There is much in our history to give us hope and courage. So if we do what we can, utilize the science, uh, give people information at the right time in the right doses, uh, give them, change their attitudes that this is not a fatalistic thing, there are things we can do. Mm -hmm. Give them skills, like these young people, give them a skill how to negotiate safe uh, sex or abstinence. You know, in a marriage it must be uh, handled well. Before marriage, it must be handled well. You know these things. You said something um, in the conference I was telling where you are, and this is as we close because we've run out of time. You said that you, you when you had HIV, um, people in church told you, don't take the medicine, let's pray. When you got cancer, they told you the same thing. Yes. Yes. I would like you to close with your thoughts on that. My thoughts is that uh, really people have put a wedge between the science and religion as if there are two gods, the God of science and the God of faith. But our God, the creator of the universe, is the one who created science. Um, so these doctors and scientists are just using God's knowledge and God's wisdom. So we should do what we can with the science, and we pray what science can't achieve on its own. Uh, and the two can give us uh, a, a, a good end. Uh, because uh, the devil doesn't heal. And, and sometimes, Josephine, I'm so surprised that the people who are condemning medicine and science are using a microphone to condemn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if science, using science. if science doesn't work, then why don't you just throw the microphone away and speak to 3,000 people and everyone is hearing as if you are near them? <laughs>
Thank you very much, Canon. Yeah. Any further thought? Anything? No, to I, I think we, we will do more. We, we have good leadership. Uh, the religious leaders are, are, are really done well. Uh, Interreligious Council is doing all it can to put us on board. The young people, who, the energy among the young people, mm -hmm. if they can really get a formation, we will, within the next uh, 10 years, by 2040, 2030, we will be looking at a Uganda that is safer, healthier, more prosperous, and more spiritually fulfilling for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kanan. And thank you very much, Patience. I, I am pushed you, but I'm glad that you made the time to come and join us. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of our show for tonight. Coming up is NTV Weekend Edition.